Imagine that we are all on board a sinking ship. There are big holes in the hull and we are taking in water at an increasing rate. Various people are pretending to do something about it. The scientists are trying to figure out how much water the ship can hold before it sinks. The engineers are designing pumps to keep the leaking ship afloat. The economists just want to keep the casino open. And everybody agrees that it will be the tra people travelling in third class who will drown first. Strangely enough, very few people seem interested in plugging the holes. On the contrary, the most lucrative job on the ship is drilling new ones. The second most lucrative is making sure that poor people remain on the lower decks. Henrik Nordberg, November the 24th. COP is a planned failure. I'm speaking today with Professor Henrik Nordberg. And um, Henrik, I came across uh, your article on COP27. Uh, it was covered by Environmental Coffee House over there and was such a brilliant article. And I just couldn't resist reaching out for you for, for, for a talk. So I think there was many of us that felt incredibly angry and frustrated, not just at COP27, but the charade that all the cops have been. And yep. uh, many of us felt that way, but not many of us expressed it as well as you did in that article. So um, before I begin on that, I, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit, just briefly about, um, you know, where you work, what you do, just so, so people can, so we can meet you a little bit. Yeah, of course. And, and I'm, I'm glad you liked the article. Well, um, so I'm... Um professor of physics at an engineering school in, in Switzerland. I, uh, my background is actually, I did a PhD in theoretical physics. I was up in the ivory tower at the ETH in Zurich and um, spent some years as a postdoc in the University of Chicago before leaving to uh, for the private sector. And I think that is the best decision of my life because I realized that if if you spend all your life in academia, you 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 don't really understand how the world works. So I so I I think I, I don't consider myself as a scientist per se. Uh, I think it's very good to have a perspective that actually sometimes you have to get things done and uh, and and that um, climate change isn't necessarily a scientific problem. I don't think it is at all. So um, and then I started, and this is kind of a, a funny story i and, and it's actually true it seems like it sounds like a cheesy movie or something but i i was actually teaching uh, physics um the law of gravity and the motion of the planets i mean as a part of the mechanics class and then of course you typically make used to make fun of um it's kind of customary to make fun of the Catholic Church and how stupid they were that they didn't want to accept sort of a, the, the science. And then I, I had this revelation, like, wait a minute, we are in exactly the same situation today for exactly the same reason. Mm -hmm. So I, I got into that and started reading a bit about Galileo and, and also some letters that Galileo wrote. And, in, and it's like, you can take his letter from 400 years ago and edit them a bit and then they apply today because it's really... I mean, the Catholic Church, of course, did not really care whether he was right or not. I mean, they saw modern astronomy as a threat to their authority, period, full stop. Whether it was true or not didn't matter. And then I realized that we are in the, exactly the same situation with climate change, of course, because, I mean, after all, the oil companies knew about this 40 years ago. Yes. Uh, they knew everything 40 years ago. Um, and... And but, everyone's forbidden to speak out about it is basically exactly the, yeah. Except people are speaking out about it, but the mainstream is not speaking out about it. I and um, exactly. I I you know just before we step in there, I, I couldn't resist the cover of your um, website there, uh, yeah. where you say um, giving our children a reason not to hate us. And um, yeah. I, I I just love to know where that came from in you. I know you are a father. Yeah, no, but I mean, it it is really that I'm I'm always had a. I mean, anyone who who loves nature and and uh, likes to 
be outdoors, of course, realize that you don't need climate scientists to tell you that something is seriously amiss today. I mean, you see it. I mean, if, if you, you observe, it's clearly observable with your naked eyes. And I, I got quite involved then in this climate Fridays for Future, etc. I, I started giving climate presentations, public presentations, and when uh, this Fridays for Future um, in climate youth movement started, I got involved and my children were also involved. And and I mean, it, it's really in this, we are letting our children down. Mm. And I, I'm, I also got a bit allergic to this. Many politicians then claim to be very pleased to see the children getting, um, getting active because they are going to fix the problem. And I mean, this is again, my background from industry. I realized that that is of course another load of hogwash basically because it, it's, I mean, if you look at who who has power in today's society, who has the say in today's society, yes. these are people looking like me. Yes. Uh, some mid-50s or above 50 white men at, at my age, basically. And the climate, the youth movement, I mean, before, the, I mean, I, I love it that they are getting involved, etc. But I mean, the problem is the way our society is structured, it will take 20 years until they have a say. Mm. They are we all know that if we are going to get out of this mess, we have to stop extracting fossil fuels from the crust of the earth. I mean, there's, and we have to do this as quickly as possible. Mm. And I mean, it's obvious. And any, and then we still continue talking about like carbon capture and, and oh, no, I mean, all, all I mean, new technology, it's, it's a perfect. I mean, we can do that. We can install solar panels. We can do, you do do a lot of things, but I mean, we have to address the main issue, which is as long as we extract carbon from the crust of the earth, the carbon concentration in the yeah. atmosphere is going to increase or the carbon dioxide concentration. And you can say the same thing about chopping down forests too. Exactly. And population, you know. Yeah. I mean, they they all marry, don't they? I, I, like go, go, getting into COP27, because I think we should dig into this article. Um, yeah. You've said... The COP is an endless cycle of planned failures. You're saying a bit more right now, but as soon as you said that, I thought, oh, thank God, someone has actually come out and said that straight. But COP is an endless cycle of planned failures. It's yep. the wrong people trying to solve the wrong problem with the wrong approach. And you went on to say that the COP starts with a series of naive assumptions. So so maybe we could get into some of those assumptions because that's yeah. really where you're starting to head right now and what you're saying. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that is a very, to me, that was a revelation because I, I, I realized that in all that COP is doing uh, and the assumption was always that there would be no major conflict between our lifestyle uh, and and fixing the climate problem it, it was it was regarded as a purely technical problem that could be fixed with some new technologies and everything would be fine and we would that way we would avoid all the hard choices and whether that was more than wishful thinking from the outset i mean we can argue over that because after all limits to growth had been published already in 1972 so i mean it was already 20 years ago that limits to growth have been published but that is not the main point the main point is by by now we know it won't be possible i mean there will be significant lifestyle changes requires and and what what that means is of course that countries that decide to it it will be costly i mean fixing the climate problem will cost a lot of money and no country is, of course, willing to voluntarily reduce its economic competitiveness. Didn't America say that uh, the only the only way they would attend if the, is if their way of life uh, was to go unquestioned or something like that? Yeah, I mean, this is a direct quote from George H. W. Bush, so um, President Bush, the elder, before going to Rio de Janeiro, because it was. Uh, I mean, this Earth Summit was not very popular, with, I think, with the oil industry in the United States. And he said, like, his, that was basically the condition for the U.S. to participate was the American way of life is non-negotiable, period. <laughs> and, no. and I mean, if, if you're really, 
<laughs> that means that the thing is, it's, it is it is negotiable because the whole thing's coming down, isn't it? Exactly. You know I mean, that is exactly what we're negotiating, but it's not by we're not going to do it by choice. Is I think the point. Exactly, and and um, I think we we have to realize that. But it means that I think the whole COP idea of voluntarily countries voluntarily agree to to reduce their emissions, etc. I mean, it's such a naive assumption. I mean, that that won't ha happen. You, and you, we, you'd go. I'm sorry. Yeah, and and this is why I so so one of the things I came up with because I started giving climate lectures is now ten years ago, and then I realized. I mean, I can't just give a lecture on, I mean, first telling, talking about the science and then telling people we're all going to die. And, and I mean, <laughs> I have to try to end on a positive note, but none of the solutions that were out there kind of convinced me because it seemed like, I mean, if you first talk about like this enormous challenge to hum humanity, and then you end your presentation with like, and th therefore we have to recycle a bit more and, and put down some solar panels. I mean, that's not really credible. I mean, it, it, it's completely- People are doing it, but it's I know, not I know. Yeah. <laughs> so so this, this is why I came up with this idea of global climate compensation. I mean, we really have to do this on a, on, on a big scale and really change the rules of a game with a foolproof system so that it will be impossible I mean, basically, we want to invalidate any business model that depends on fossil fuels. Well, let's get, so let's. I'll come back to that uh, the the compensation model. But yeah. one of the things in that um, in that uh, article that you wrote is there's a there's you put in a graph there, uh, yeah. and I've got the graph and I'll put it up here as well where. Yeah. The, the G20 countries have all got together and said, oh, it's like we agree on, um, you know, no less than 2% growth, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they've all agreed to uh, to cut carbon. And can you just talk <laughs> us through that, what, what that graph's about? Yeah, I mean, it it was. Uh, I mean, I was I was playing around a bit with with data from. I mean, all this data is publicly available. So this is data from the from BP and and. Um, the World Bank, etc. You get so you have global GDP and you have global carbon emissions, <clears throat> and if you plot them in one diagram and scale the axis appropriately, then you see that I mean, there's a very for 60 years these two curves are basically on top of, of each other. You even see it like if you have a the financial crisis 2008 2009, there's a dip in carbon emissions and a dip in GDP, and then. The COVID crisis, of course, there's a dip in GDP and dip in carbon emissions. I mean, they are really there's a very, very strong correlation between these two curves. And and then I I just had this idea. Okay, so let's see for the future. I mean, after all, I mean, all all industrial countries and this is G20. I think they decide at some point. I mean, at least two percent economic growth, global growth. That's what we need to keep our system running. And then. You have a Paris Agreement. So two curves that have been like perfectly correlated for about 60 years suddenly are supposed to be completely anti-correlated. I mean, that the richer they get, we, we get the less we will consume somehow, which is kind of an, an, an insane idea. And, and the fun thing happened, actually, because I, I started showing this in my lectures. And, and it's really, the, it's beautiful if you use that in a lecture. It's kind of a crowd pleaser, because when you put this up, I mean, the audience starts, starts laughing because, I mean, it becomes so obvious to everyone that this is absolute, I mean, BS. I mean, this is not going to work. I mean, there's no sane person can yes. believe that that is actually going yes. to happen. Yes. And um, so, I mean, it, it's a useful plot, but I mean, the, it, it's based on real data. I mean, there's no, I mean, no, <laughs> I'm not cheating here. I mean, this is basically the official policy is and I, I and then i typically have his title on top of it like if you want to summarize climate policies of today it is basically and then a miracle appear happens i mean it's like it it's it complete i mean hoping for a miracle to happen well, this is this is a little bit like what you were saying about galileo here because yeah. it seems to me like what can't be said is that this you know i mean i i mean i already think it's too late for any solutions, personally. But I, I do want to hear your input on this. But mm -hmm. but our civilization cannot 
keep running the way that it's been the way that it's running now it yep. just cannot so we either orchestrate some kind of awkward crash landing or it's or it's suicide yeah i know i totally agree i i mean there is um i'm on the first point i'm i'm of course also if i want to be realistic about it i'm i'm i think the 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 chances of getting out of this alive are pretty slim yeah. um unfortunately which is a horrible thing to say but i mean uh, especially if you have children and, and and i mean also standing in front of young people i mean that really gets me i mean i'm i'm teaching so you have a whole room full of like young people in the early 20s they're supposed to have their whole life ahead of them and and we are letting them down i mean and and we have to change that so um i mean that is um i i i see that that's that that is a problem but there's so much we could do and this is why i also think that um we we simply have to accept that this will the, it, it's kind of like you have a, I mean, if you have a leaky roof or something, I mean, it's not a business opportunity, but you still have to fix it. I mean, you, so the, the point is, the point is really that the, we have to accept that doing something here will cost a lot. It will yes. cost an enormous amount of money. And then yeah. starting as a physicist, you realize, of course, that uh, all, I mean, no company in the world manufactures carbon. I mean, carbon is created inside big stars and basically, so the amount of carbon atoms of this at on this planet is a constant. The question is only where we, how we distribute it. And that of course means that an airline in that sense doesn't create carbon emissions it, it, because it buys the carbon it then lets out into the atmosphere. So if you want to introduce a carbon tax, the way obvious way to start is of course where it's taken out of the ground mm -hmm. and that is a small number of companies a couple of hundred companies that are in the business of extracting carbon from the crust of the earth and the idea would of course be and and we know from chemistry from stoichiometry that if you have a barrel of oil and you burn that oil and sooner or later it will be burnt we know exactly how much carbon dioxide will be created so why don't we force a company like shell to pay a certain fee for each barrel of oil they sell um, and they would of course basically pass this cost on to their customers so they would in this model simply be tax collectors for a global carbon tax so i don't think they would actually i think i know people at shell and i think they i mean many of them say well fine fair enough if if you can get every fossil fuel company to get on board, then we don't have a problem with that because I mean we won't will not have a competitive disadvantage and um, we will pass on the costs to customer and we would have a global carbon tax. And then the other part, it would raise an enormous amount of money. Uh, I do this example with hundred dollars per per car, uh, ton of carbon, and that would then generate three point six trillion dollars annually to a global fund, which is compares, I mean, if you compare that to like two, two trillion for military spending, et cetera, I mean, it, it's in the right ballpark. That's a significant number that would actually have an impact on things. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have to distribute that money. And my idea was just to get the climate justice then implemented immediately. So send it back to nations on a per capita basis. So basically we, we, and with it, this, um, uh, yeah, I think I, I, if you do it with $100 per ton of carbon dioxide, you would get basically every human being would get like some $400 per, per year. So you could, which shows you also the magnitude of the uh, inequalities we have in society. Because, I mean, $450 per year for someone living in Switzerland, that's peanuts. But for someone living in Somalia, that's a lot of money. I yes. mean, you, you could do so much good with that. So you yes. could basically abolish yes. global yes. poverty yes. immediately. I, I guess the um, I guess two things come up when you when you talk about this and, um, you know, like 
that is a decent plan, as is reducing <laughs> population to under, yeah. under a billion. Um, getting people to, <laughs> to agree to pay even one cent more for yeah. anything oil related. But yeah. but but leaving aside that, uh, you also made a really good point uh, about the military in mm -hmm. in your article. And you said you you came around to it saying that oil is like the ring of power in Lord of the yep. Rings. So yep. um, could you explain that analogy and and uh, what what the military might think of this? And I think it is like that. So we are in this vicious circle today that as long as we depend on oil, we need the military to protect the oil wells. And there is, I think, this... I got it from that book, this uh, logo or the, the emblem of the US Central Command, which is basically an American eagle guarding the Persian Gulf. I think it's, per I mean, it says it all. <laughs> I mean, it's it really beautiful. does say it all. It really does and, say it all. Yeah, go, sorry, go on. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's really, I mean, we kill for oil is kind of the motto. I mean, if, and, and, and this is not, I mean, he, he in this book, he, he cites, he quotes some documents, I mean, official, document by the American government, which clearly states as a policy that we are going to attack any country that is going to limit our access to oil from the Persian Gulf, yeah. period. <laughs> and um, so, so, so as long as we, we depend on oil, we need, uh, we need military to protect our access to oil. On the other hand, as long as we need mi the military, we are dependent on oil because that's the only way we can fuel our military. So it's like, it's the ultimate vicious circle. But it also means that if we cutting down, I mean, we. I th think if you if you think about decarbonization, it's more like a disarmament problem in a way because we also know that countries that have the most advanced technology and the most advanced manufacturing industry they typically win in wars. Yes. They have no one wants to be in the position of American Indians where or the American Nat Native Americans where you you basically have uh, you have stone axes. I mean, you you live in a in a nice society, but you only have stone axes, and suddenly the Spanish conquistadors arrive in, with their uh, steel armor and steel weapons, and then you're basically gone. I mean, so it 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 really kind of it it's the ultimate prisoner's dilemma or. I mean, we, we don't trust each other. And as long as we don't trust each other, everyone wants to have his, the ring of power. You're not going to give up the ring of power as long as you feel threatened. Yes. It's such a good analogy. Uh, there's yes. something about that because then, but having the ring of power also yes. degrades us. Exactly. Also, you know, signals our own end, really. Yeah, it, it will kill us ultimately. Yes. I mean, it, it's it's it's. I think there are many metaphors for that, or many uh, variants of that uh, that story in mythology. But it's really like yeah. you have this supreme weapon, yeah. but it's actually going to kill you, and, and you have to give it up at some point. But yeah. unless the others do it too, yes. you can't really do it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know why I laugh about that. I mean, I I, I also can find myself crying about that as well yes. henry you know so yeah. um so i it just seems like the ridiculousness of it sort of strikes me with that yeah. analogy somehow and um, i'm a huge lord of the ring fan so yeah. so something about that analogy and then also just realizing like okay even if we you know put a tax on oil and everyone cuts mm -hmm. down on oil the military is not cutting down on oil. The militaries no. are not going to give up. They, what did you say? You said something like the fear of defeat uh, mm -hmm. in battle is more near term than the fear mm -hmm. of uh, the suicide that we're committing by keeping on using. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, you see this so clearly. I, I, and, and I mean, the whole, I mean, the COP meetings have, of course, become sort of the definition of insanity. I mean, oh. repeatedly doing the same thing and hoping for different outcome each, every time, which is kind of, I mean, it's ridiculous. But I mean, you also see it with these, now that there was a discussion about loss and damage and they now have a fund for lo loss and damage, but there's no funding for this fund. But also the 100 billion they were talking about before at the Glasgow meeting, this climate uh, 
emerge what do you, I don't the green clan or whatever I don't I, I keep forgetting the name of this fund that that they have been talking about so for so long now and and it was sort of celebrated that as a success that they now have the, the commitment for the hundred hundred billion dollars and then you see Russia attacks Ukraine and what happens in Germany first Germany agrees immediate to increase its defense spend, spending by hundred billion dollars yes I mean just like that no yes. discussion. I mean, it was never about money. The money is there if you feel threatened. And they also decided to in, invest some $200 billion in uh, building LNG terminals to, to be able to import liquid natural gas from, from Africa and from the US, et cetera. Yeah. Just like that, no problem. I mean, and, and that shows like the, the um, why it's all a farce, of course, because the government's are capable of acting quickly. I mean, they can take decisions like that. Also Sweden, I mean, I'm, I'm originally from Sweden. I mean, they, they do this um, NATO. I mean, Sweden used to be a neutral country. I mean, and was very proud of being this neutral, neutral country. And suddenly Russia attacks Ukraine and without basically any political debate, they decide to join NATO. I mean, it's, it's like these governments are, capable of taking decisions like that they are capable of investing a lot of stuff yes. but they are basically uh, marionettes are basically uh, puppets in the hands of of commercial interests so they only do that when i mean if if yes. the rich and powerful want them to do something then they can do something and yes. otherwise yes. they they cannot yes. but the rich and powerful are never going to vote in favor of um of, no. of scaling down the civilization and bringing down the population numbers, that is never going to happen because that's that will eliminate their power. Exactly. I mean, this is probably the the. I mean, it's probably the, the this is as old as humanity itself. I guess it's like the rich and the powerful in any society got rich and powerful because they benefited from the existing system and any change in changing that system will of course threaten their power so they are going to be against it mm -hmm. and and that is basically the that is of course the the, the problem we have to address somehow um yeah and and i look i want to go back um to to a question because when we land here um it opens up existential areas doesn't it and you touched on yeah. one earlier around when you're talking to kids and mm -hmm. um you know as an adult i mean you know i, I feel the same i'm a white privileged male mm -hmm. and uh when i'm talking around when i'm talking to kids i always feel this deep sense of um wanting to tell them the truth if they want yeah. to hear but also wanting to apologize even though i even though I, you know, I've been a pawn in this thing the same as everyone, but I yeah. have lived a life. And, mm -hmm. I, and I just wonder how you, you've got children yourself. Like, yeah. how do you, how do you manage what you see with, you know, with the young ones? Yeah. No, but I think it is really um, coming back to the statement I have on my blog that giving my children a reason not to hate me or it, it, it's really like that that i want to be able to look them in the eyes and say look guys i tried my best yes i mean i i have done everything in my power to actually mm -hmm. fix the problem mm -hmm. um if i fail i will fail with some honor at least left yes. like that yes. it's and yes. i think that's the best we can hope for i mean yes. you you do what you can um yes and I think that can be very motivational. I, I, I think also this, my engagement and my, my activities are kind of therapeutical also yes, because yes, I, yes. I, I think I would go mad if I didn't do anything. Yeah. Yes, yes. Look, I, I feel the same. I feel the same in terms of the groups I run and these interviews yeah. and my documentary. Like if I don't have something to do that has yeah. some value, um, you know, other than shopping and you know, planning, mm -hmm. you know, some stupid holiday that has no meaning, I would go nuts. Exactly. But it's there's a very interesting paper I found once. It's called 
Homo ignorance. So it, it's it, called which? Homo ignorance. Homo so ignorance. It's, 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 yeah, so it's, it's a tie to, I think they were German psychologists who wrote a paper about this, like um, the idea that people are curious and want to know the truth and want to find out things is, of course, wrong because we have this. They, they introduce the term deliberate, deliberate ignorance that we deliberately choose, many people deliberately choose not to know things because it makes life more bearable. And I mean, we all are guilty of that to some extent. I mean, the classical example was, of course, in, in Nazi Germany. I mean, everyone who, who was prepared to put some thought into that, yes. of course, understood what was happening to the Jews. Yes. Yes. But most people didn't want to know. So they, I mean, and, and I mean, today in Europe, I mean, how many Europeans know how many refugees drown in the Med Mediterranean yes. every day? Yes. And yes. I mean, and if you talk to people, so like, what, why should I want to know that? Like, <laughs> yes. because it makes me miserable. And and I, to me, it was very important because I realized if, if I give my climate, the problem is, of course, if you give climate presentations, you very often you're preaching to the choir. The people who voluntarily show up, uh, they are, of course, already convinced and they are the people who, who do care about climate, the climate crisis. Mm. Um, but for the others, there is, of course, this problem. They have actually spent some effort building up, up this wall of ignorance around them. Mm. I mean, they've actually made a real effort not to know about this stuff. Mm. And then you go up there on, on, on the stage and tell them how it is. And then and, and not everyone appreciates that. Well, one thing that you outlined that was coming that I actually didn't know about. I mean, I guess the, you know, in terms of the literature I read, we passed tipping points sort of, you know, decades yeah. ago. But yeah. you talked about, uh, you, you mentioned 450 parts per million um, CO2. Yeah. And yeah. Um, obviously, you know, I know Bill McKibben and 350.org and all that that we left yeah. long ago is we're up at 420. Yeah. Now. What are we going up now by 2.57 parts per million a year and increasing? Yeah. But yeah. you said at 450, uh, something else happens. And uh, I, and this is just, that, that's a new point for me to get my head around. What happens there? Well, I, I mean, it, it's a bit vague, I think. I've been, because, I mean, if you talk, look at the carbon budgets that are being quoted for, for uh, there's a carbon budget for 1.5 degrees centigrade, yeah. and that's that's yeah. below 450 clearly. And then there's a carbon budget for for two degrees centigrade, and and that's above that's something at 480. But on the other hand, the Paris Agreement was to stay considerably or significantly below 2.0 degrees of warming. So then I thought, well, 450 ppm is somewhere in the middle. But if you pass that. Line, then we can forget, totally forget the Paris Agreement. Of course, I agree with you. I mean, we are going to pass, I mean, the Paris Agreement we can forget anyway. I mean, yes. I don't think that's, that's there's no chance that that will, will happen. Somehow, the, the, I mean, I loved your analogy right at the start, you know, talking about Galileo. Like, yeah. just pure sense here would have yeah. us preparing for yeah. the damage that's already created to arrive shutting mm -hmm. down our civilization yeah. and our oil use, shutting down our population. Common sense would have us doing things uh, mm -hmm. that are seemingly nowhere on the radar. Yeah. And, and I guess yeah. that's why, you know, I mean, everybody has their thing to do in this. And I, I feel like one of the things for me is like, I've got to answer the existential question that arises and I feel to help people to ask that existential question, this is coming down and how am I going to be with this? How am I going to be with my family? You know, mm -hmm. what's important to me? To, how do I live? Um, you know, yeah. what what do I need to do? These type of questions, you, you can't, you start off as a physicist, as a PhD yeah. as a physicist, and you end up in the, in the depths of philosophy. That, that, that is true. I, I, 
the, the way I'm looking at it, I, because honestly, I mean, as a as starting out as a physicist, I mean, I, I, when I started looking at this problem, I started as a physicist and said, okay, climate research, that sounds like an interesting thing. And then I realized, well, it's not because we know for more than 40 years, we know everything we need to know. I mean, the problem is not climate. I mean, we know enough about the climate, we have to act. And then, I mean, you look into renewable energies, et cetera, and, and yes, there are things you can do that, and then that's not wrong, but I mean, it's not going to solve the problem. And and then you have to to move, as you said, into philosophy, et cetera. But um, so I think, as you pointed out, it in a way, if you start rationally, based on physics and based on the laws of nature, it's fairly obvious that has to happen. I mean, as you said, we have to stop using fossil fuels. You have to cut down the population. I mean, all these things are actually obvious. I mean, there's no way around it. Um, so the challenge is, of course, to find sort of a narrative. Uh, and I think one part important step is people have to dare to ask the right questions. I mean, I see Bertolt Brecht, the German playwright, Brecht wrote a very nice piece on Galileo. It, it's very, it's well worth reading because he makes this point. Galileo, of course, at the end surrendered. I mean, he agreed to shut up. I mean, he was, uh, uh, his, his teachings were suppressed by the Catholic Church. And um, he, he regrets that. And then basically, Gal uh, Brecht has him said that because of this now, scientists will become sort of a, a race of inventive gnomes that can be rented for everything. Yes, so still we have I, to I'm telling my students, since I now have his title as a professor to really I'm, I'm i'm really saying this to my student like i'm going to abuse my position as a professor to do as much good as i can because mm -hmm. in a way if i don't speak out i mean i i understand the challenges i also have a fairly safe position i mean to get fired as a professor you have to i mean you have to it's difficult <laughs> i mean you have to so you i mean so you have kind of a, a a voice in society, you have a safe jobs and you have a very decent income. So if I don't raise my voice, who is going to do it? And I think we have to dare, we have to, we, we clearly have to build up a new narrative. Yes. I mean, a, a very compelling narrative that convinces people to go in this direction. And I think as a first I don't know at the moment what this narrative is. I'm, I'm, this is why I'm trying to reach out to as many people as possible to to to. Well, it's, a, it's you know the trouble is it's a crap narrative, isn't it? It's like we need to crash land or it's suicide. Do you know what I mean? Like that. that yep. Essentially, that's the narrative. Like we're going to crash land and there's going to be a shitload of suffering. Uh, but if we don't do that, then chances are yep. that we're, we're, it's human extinction. Like that's yep. the narrative. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it it is. I mean, sadly, we have gone from like, if you go back to from a geocentrical worldview to a heliocentrical worldview, and now we are back to an egocentrical world worldview. Yes. That well, yes. I mean, it's all about me, 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 and and we are so rooted in in the now and in in me, in in doing things for yourself. Yes, and this has changed um, dramatically over the last hundred or so years. Yes. I mean, yes. Yuval Harari writes about this in his book. Uh, like, he talks about the Gilgamesh project where he says, I mean, scientists since, I think he says 150 years have been trying to, we have we started to think about death as a technical problem that can be solved. And before that, <sighs> death was of course, I mean, the inevitable, consequence of of living and it was in most religions i mean death was um, was what gave life meaning in a way mm. and i i'm very there is a viking from the vikings from the icelandic sagas there is this uh, quote which i like which i find so beautiful and and it, it's like the only one of the few religious quotes that really gets it's not really religious but it goes back to the free the pagan times of of northern of scandinavia and it's like this 
cattle die, friends die, you are also going to die. I know only one thing that never dies, the judgment passed on the dead. And I think that's beautiful because I think to me, that is kind of the inspiration to say, I mean, I'm, 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 I can do whatever I want. I mean, with, within, I mean, I could, if I do everything to, to sort of live health, et cetera, I could extend my life perhaps by five, five, six years, no guarantee. I mean, even if I try to live a very healthy life, I can die earlier. So, I mean, so plus minus 10 years, I'm going to die anyway. I mean, at a certain age. What I can do is, of course, that that the, I live on in the memory of people for having done something good. And I think we have to get back to that because you're right. It, it's a crappy narrative if you if you define the meaning of life that you are going to be. I mean, if you live for yourself, I mean, you, yes. you, you everything you do is for yourself. Yes. Then yes. there is no then there is no reason to save a planet. I mean, then you can, of course, say like. Yes. I mean, why? I mean, it, it, and of course, ultimately, it's not the science. It's it that is absolutely not about science because we can, of course, say, well, okay, so the planet goes to hell. Let's party, <laughs> and, and and that's it. So unless you have this like multi generational perspective, I don't think you can find a narrative that's going to work. Yeah, I I, I love that. Um... Henrik, and uh, I think we're, we're pretty much on time to bring that to a close. And that's a perfect closing moment. I think it's so true what you said. Sure. And, um, you know, that's the narrative. That's the meaning we need to find. And and I look, I sincerely love your writing on Substack. And, I, and I'm going to put links to it and just, you know, really recommend that everyone go to there and have a read of the many things you've written. Um, <laughs> So thank you so much for your time yep. and uh, thank you. we'll talk again. <laughs>